Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah. And there may be somebody else who joins us. Um, that's fine. We'll pull them into the fold. Welcome, everybody. I think I know most of you. My name's Kathleen. And um, you all know me. But for the, maybe there are people online who don't. So hello, yes. everyone. Is there a way to see the, the people when we so, go around? Yeah, not, not everybody has their, well, nobody has their uh, video on, on oh, here. Oh, oh, here we go. One second. So I need it. In fact, this. this oh, oh, good. So yeah. hey, Marilyn, you there's Marilyn. Really good to see you. Um, Jeff, I'm going to oh, turn it yeah. over. Sorry. Oh, oh sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to unmute everybody and have uh, right. chaos ensue. But well, why don't you start? <laughs> uh, you're a yeah, yeah. job with uh, all this uh, stuff. So we were so, talking about tech a little bit and improving our tech, and we're going to just segue right into that. Yeah. And go around so houses. I'm Jeff, Jeff O'Keefe, the new curator here. Uh, just a yeah. couple little housekeeping things, right? Uh, I have everybody muted in, the, uh, in Zoom here. Uh, if you have questions or you want to speak, I'm going to ask that you go and put something into the chats just so that we don't have everybody talking over each other. Um, and the chat, where can they find the chat? So just in that's in the them. bottom corner here. It would usually be if you close out this chat. Uh, it's down on this bottom board somewhere. <laughs> One sec. Yeah, if this closes out, there's this little thing that says chat right here. Just click on that and it'll open up. Okay. Yeah. And if you if you if it doesn't work way, then we'll try to yes, yes. see you doing that. And figure it out. What else? Ask questions, zoom mute, mute. Oh. And we we are working on and I know it's really it's got the hard job. Yeah, we're doing many things. We're uh, working on um improving our zoom yes know, our streaming and one of the challenges is we're not going to spend the whole time talking about this but just so you understand is we're going to work on getting a bit better audio quality and yeah. video quality uh working on things right now but uh definitely speaking one at a time especially in this room if we're conversing about something yeah. we'll make everything a lot clearer because um, we're using the microphone off the laptop. Yes. And when you, it, anyway, it, it's an equipment issue and we'll end up with the yeah. equipment. Yeah. Down the line. So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of a sum, summary there. So we were going to inter go around the room maybe first. I'm taking over. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm not. <laughs> Everybody, if you want to introduce yourselves, well, go. Go no teach. Yeah. <laughs> You're running the show. Okay. So, all right. So we'll start. We already met Jeff. And maybe if you don't mind going around and just saying your first name, mm -hmm. you could say your last name too. And then we'll start with the people here. Then we'll go to the Zoom people, unmute them, and they'll have a chance to say who they are. So we'll start with Mr. Wilson over yeah. there. Paul Wilson. Uh, mm -hmm. Mary. We we both live across the street from uh, the Whiteleys. Oh, you do. Formerly the Farleys, and um, that's our interest in. So you have all here. kinds of stories you could no, tell. Not really, mm -hmm. yeah, you're Maybe. too busy in the summer. Probably. Maybe a few. Maybe. But you wanted to see that. <laughs> okay, Mary Wilson. Same. Mm -hmm. I'm Marilyn Cushing. And I'm just interested in the Yukon history. Lonnie, <clears throat> Lonnie Bitsy, and I'm up from Sturgeon Bay, but I'm a lover of Ephraim, and so I just want to hear more about it. Mm -hmm. Carolyn O'Donnell, I'm here for a week, and I was at church yesterday, and Kathleen invited me because she knows I have an interest in Ephraim, too. A lot of you probably know my mom, Anne. Like, so, oh, yes. Um, that's my connection. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm Barbara Gould, and I've been coming to Ephraim since about 1955. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes living here, sometimes not. Well, now I do. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. 
And Barbara, you're the St. Louis, you're from St. Yeah, Louis. St. Louis. And I think a lot of us know, but there might be some who don't, that there's a big St. Louis influence, in particular, early to mid 20th century, a lot of St. Louis people. Yeah, out. my mother in law mm -hmm. worked at the uh, camp in the park. In the park. Um, that's how we all got started. Libby Gould. Mm -hmm. And she also did the beautiful, um, it looks a little, you know, it's older now, but this big lace exhibit and tatting exhibit in the Anderson store was your, was your mother-in-law's yeah. effort. So kind of interesting. So anybody that wants to introduce themselves on Zoom here? Oh, here. <laughs> so I guess you have to- Let me, yeah, I asked oh. to unmute. There you go. Oh, you don't know that's Sherry. Oh, it's just Sherry saying hi. Love Ephraim, love living there. But I'm in Lake Forest for the moment, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just for a couple of days. Anybody else? Yeah. It's Marilyn. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Marilyn Whiteley, <clears throat> greeting you from Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Guelph spelled unlikely G U E L P H, Guelph. Okay, that's one of our our special guests really today, Marilyn. And I don't know, Jim, maybe Jim can say hello. Can you say hello, Jim? Yeah, this is Jim and Pat Blair. And we live uh, near the Fartig Orchard. Okay, <laughs> hello. And I have to, is there anybody else or are those are through? I think this is everybody who right. has their uh, their camera on, but I know there are a couple more people in uh, just watching. Okay. But uh, I don't know. Oh, George and Linda Carey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It looks like, and Catherine. I don't know, can you, uh, if you unmute them, does a, just a blank video show up? I think so. I mean, try, try somebody and we'll see. Yeah. Um, maybe. Catherine Rulison, can we unmute Catherine to see if she responds? Yeah, I'm just asking everybody to unmute now. Okay. And everybody can self-regulate. <laughs> well. Okay, I guess that's everybody, that's everybody, yeah. everybody's quiet. Um, I do have a question for uh, Marilyn, if you could unmute yeah. her for a minute. Marilyn, can you clear up for me because I hear different, your name pronounced different ways. So the, the <laughs> married name Whiteley is Whiteley, but it's got two E's in it. Whiteley, not Whitley, Whiteley, yes. correct? But I tell us about the umlaut over your verdict. Well, <clears throat> it's a Swedish word meaning finished or ready. And my grandfather was a Gustafsson when he emigrated, but this had been his grandfather's army name because in the Swedish army, think of all the Johnsons, Andersons, Gustafsons and so forth there were. <clears throat> the people doing the required service in this in the Swedish army took sort of official nicknames. And so when my grandfather immigrated, there were apparently, hard to believe, too many Gustafsons in the lumber camps near Marinette and Menominee. And he changed, he got permission and changed his name to his grandfather's army name, Ferdig. Or I suppose it would be more like Ferdig. So you, you, pronounce, you pronounce it so, fair dig, like fair. As if it were F-A-I-R, because that's closer to the Swedish pronunciation. Okay. Thank you. But it comes with a it comes with the story that I just gave you. Wonderful. There aren't many of us. Not many. Okay. Well, thank you for that, for clearing that up for me, because I know I've pronounced it every which way. So I'll be more correct going forward. Well, here we are with another history chat. We're going to kind of dive right in. Um, today's the topic is kindness, kindness, and it's kind of a nod, I suppose, in a way to Valentine's Day, but 
we're really not going to talk about Valentine's Day. We're going to talk about that good old quality of being kind. And the purpose is, as you know, the purpose, there are many of these chats, there's a social purpose, really getting to know each other. But I think one of the things that I guess as a staff and as a community of members that we're sort of interested in is building, continuing to build that sense of place, that sense of wonder that is really Ephraim. And that um, Ephraim has, is a, like other places in Door County, but Ephraim specifically really is a place where there have been a lot of stories of courage and kindness. So I'm borrowing from the National Park Service, but this place is special because it's a place of wonder and there are these amazing stories um, of community, really. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from with some of this. Plus, really, it's just a lot of fun to share stories. There's three parts to this, and I'm going to need your help with all of them. Oops, I moved our board to the back. So we're going to talk, we're going to frame it. And we have about an hour. I'll try, you know, to keep move, things moving. But we can stay all day if you want. <laughs> well, not really. Final, <laughs> final, final point. We're out of it. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to bring up the idea of um, the the brochure that was done in 1975. It might have been 74, but it was distributed throughout the Ephraim community in 75, a village of values. So that's going to be a topic that frames this discussion about kindness in a way, one of the values of the village. And then we're going to move to an example, a really wonderful example of kindness. And through the story of Marilyn's uh, parents, and that section is kind of talk, talk, titled An Unexpected Beginning. Some of you who have the handouts might have looked through that story already. And then we'll kind of move into our stories and memories of kindness that may hopefully have an equal connection. And I know a lot of us could tell all kinds of stories that don't have an equal connection, but we're gonna to try to corral it with some connection even. So does anybody remember when this brochure was, uh, was a big deal back in the 70s? It is hard to, anybody? It's just, you do remember seeing it. This is what the brochure looked like. It was a so kind of a silver colored brochure. These, there's a couple copies there for you to look at, and then you have a handout as well. So it's, to me, it's hard to believe uh, you guys are, well, I, I don't want to say youngsters, but that's <laughs> but, but it's, I, you know, in the seventies, I was in high school. And it's hard to believe that, that that's 50 years ago, 50 years ago. And by the way, the story, An Unexpected Beginning, is about 40 years prior to that. So uh, in a way, we're, we're seeing the example of the story, The Unexpected Beginning, is what came out in words with this, I, today we call it a marketing brochure, or really it was a fundraising brochure. It was developed, well, oops, I almost forgot. It was developed by um, Oscar Bolt, and I think a guy named George Norton, I think he was oh, George Norton. Yeah, I think he was involved in this. And there were a couple other names involved too. Do you, before we get into the, a little bit of the meat of it, do you recognize, as you look at it, do you recognize the style of drawing? And I'm gonna give you a clue as to who drew it. There's a portrait behind me <laughs> of that guy, that man. Mm -hmm. Charles Peterson. Charles, Charles Peterson. Peterson. So Chip Peterson, his portrait is here and it's on the screen for those of you back at home. Um, Chip Peterson was part of what I like to call the resume three group. And that was a kind of a group of artists that came in in the late 60s and early 70s. And it was, all, to me, it was almost like um, what happened out in California with Joni Mitchell and all, you know, all that crowd with the Canyon crowd. It was just this confluence of artists that came up here at that time. Chick Peterson was a little bit older. He had children, he and Sue had children, but he was still part of that group. So he's the guy that um, did the drawings. And I think 
He was a commercial artist, help me out, Cody. Wasn't did he come from a com commercial background? I believe so. Yeah. And um, anyway, so I think it's sort of interesting that he was just fairly newly arrived, had only been here a short time, living here permanently, that is. And he did the drawings. The other name that is worth mentioning, I always like lifting up names if we can, is, um, oh gosh, now I gotta look at her name. Where's my notes? It's on the, the very last page. She was a, a Lawrence University teacher, a, a um, Sturgeon Bay. Marguerite Schumann. Marguerite Schumann. She did a lot of the, the crafting of the text. So I'm giving a nod to some of those people who created this brochure. And to me, oh, and by the way, the brochure was created, um, as I said, for a fundraiser. Yeah, they were launching a, a drive. Guess how much they were trying to raise? It sounds like peanuts today to me. Well, double that, 20,000. And that was a big deal, you know, back in the 70s. Um, I'll pass around this article that was in the Door County Advocate that kind of tells you a little bit about what were the foundation, you know, what it was all about and what it was trying to do. Okay, so a village of values. We did Chick Peterson. We talked about this, this uh, fundraiser that was going to go on. Oh, another part name that I want to mention that was kind of a part of that whole discussion then, from what I can tell from the minutes, was Olga Dana. Mm -hmm. And what does that have to do with the foundation? She donated her. Yeah, that, it was right after she, I don't know if she had died already or was, or had, was, had created it. But anyway, that was all part of this. And from what I can gather, the foundation, it, this is, in other words, to me, this is a foundational document, really, of how we spent, what, did, did we accomplish what this document said the foundation was going to accomplish? So it's pretty interesting. Um, anyway, the foundation had been around about 25 years, and they had, from what I can tell, and then we'll open it up if you, if you agree, they the foundation had had done what Aldo Leopold, that's a conservationist, always recommended. The first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the parts. So they had a plan for Anderson's store. They'd had the schoolhouse. They'd gotten some of this. And what was going to be the next step for the next 50 years? That's, I think, what this document really reflects. Any comments on that? What do you think? Some of you were around back then. Anybody out there? I can't see anybody out there. Okay, so, all right. Well, in any case, um, let's look just a little bit at pieces of this brochure or parts of it. To me, if you did anybody read through it at all, maybe you'll take it home and look at it. It is definitely a 20th century uh, document. Mm -hmm. And why is that? What, could you have this many words in something like that today? That's number one, right? Yeah, the type is so small. There's some there's some things in it I think that are the data as far as um, uh, gender. You know, it's yeah. all talking about man's man helping nature and that sort of thing. But I don't want to get too caught up in that. I still think the prose and the writing is absolutely. Beautiful, you know, very 20th century, a little bit flowery, but very uplifting, at least for me. Um, let's see, Paige, I wanted to kind of look at Paige. I think one paragraph that jumped out is yeah. under the historic heritage. Yeah. Like Lizzie's comment to somebody who wanted to buy cigarettes. Yeah. Yes. I thought that is, you know, that really, when you think about the Lutheran Church and the Moravian Church and their influence on this village. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. That, isn't that good? Yeah. Can you can you just maybe read the sentence sure. for those who don't know? Made a statement about village values. Miss Lizzie Anderson once stood resolutely behind her counter while a visiting yachtsman complained about the lack of cigarettes and playing cards on the shelves. And what is it you do keep? The visitor inquired acidly. We keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Was Ms. Lizzie Brisk and reply? Yes. I yeah. love that. Yeah. It sounds like, did anything jump else jump out at anybody and kind of reason through this? Well, to me, the one thing that caught my eye was 
Ephraim's values are now threatened. And that just sounds like so alarmist almost. Mm -hmm. And then reading through there, and it makes me think, okay, had the foundation not really got its feet under it and gone yes. forward, what would the village have been like? I mean, it yeah, seems never. <laughs> yes. Well, it seems as though uh, we've become so used to the foundation and what it does mm -hmm. and what Ephraim has become probably in large part because of the foundation, but it just seemed so like dire here the way it's put forward in this brochure. And it, it just makes me wonder, well, I guess maybe they ran the flag up to pole and uh, we're living with the results and we can be grateful for that. Yeah. Shortly before the, or when this brochure was being developed, there was a, um, a lot, a lot of contention about a land plan or uh, some kind of a town plan mm -hmm. in Ephra back in the mid '70s. I don't know if anybody was here and remembers that. No. You were a little bit, I mean, yeah. I feel like speaking that too. The third paragraph under Ephraim's values now threatened. You know, it sounds like they're speaking to a lot of things we still are yeah, facing today. Yeah, yeah. still yeah. contemporary yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah. And they had the foresight to be thinking about groundwater lake water pollution right. already back then. That's something yeah. that's coming to a head right now, yeah. too. So yes. it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, move over to preservation efforts in the past. One of the things that caught my eye um, in, in that section, in the third paragraph down, is in the past, the Ephraim Foundation has centered its work on the preservation of history and culture. But now, rooted firmly in the philosophy of life, which has grown up in the village, it is enlarging its interests. And so, of course, then I was thinking, well, okay, they're shifting the, the focus a little to just preserving the building to what? And if you turn to the Ephraim idea on the back, and I think there's, there it is, the Ephraim idea on the back, you'll see that to me, in a way, they laid out this is this is what we're going to work on mm -hmm. for the next mm -hmm. few decades. Mm -hmm. And at the top, I had to laugh at the top, well, not laugh in a bad way, just I thought it was kind of funny. Um, the very first thing is listed <laughs> is what color buildings? <laughs> yeah. White buildings. All right. So we see that very firmly said there. And I was really surprised and happy to see physical access to the shoreline, because that really is a thing that makes this village unique, in particular visually. So the access. And then the second thing that's mentioned under the Ephraim idea is what? The business. Yeah, that's always a little bit yeah. controversial. Yeah. So minimal business development. I found it interesting that they wrote, they. Um, highlighted current constructive enterprises. I mean, these words are all really <laughs> carefully yeah. chosen. And then the third one, which kind of ties into our kindness thing today in a way, <laughs> anybody pull out any, can anybody pull out any phrases or words that find, you find Church interesting? Made it. Yeah, I don't know if you'd say that today in a broad mm. marketing appeal, probably not for better or worse, right? So church-related emphasis, wholesome, wholesome. So, yeah, I like the word temperate amusements, yes. <laughs> that's really beautiful. It seems that you think about when they first were considering lucre. Oh, yes, oh, I mean, that was, among the yeah, yeah, still, a, still an issue, right? yeah. The fourth one talks about, um, this is, I thought, really interesting, respect for learning. So they were kind of laying down the foundation people at the time, it seems to me, were laying down the gauntlet. We're also going to educate people. We're not just going to preserve, we're going to educate. And then lastly, um, preserving, a lot of people might not know this, but it's preserving historical what? Oh, Landmarks. And so that means things like, the bronze tablets, it means the um, the monument to the Vietnam that mm -hmm. Helgeson guy. Uh, I don't know if there are other there are other um, landmarks, Cody. Did I hit that? There's, yeah, there's 
plaques around the plaques around around town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the one on the dock, there's the one at Moravia Point. Yeah. And I thought it interesting that they had the insight to write that last part of the sentence, but to, re to um, preserve these historic landmarks, not just as physical reminders of the past, but as an influence on the development around them. That's the significance of, a, of a, some kind of a landmark. It's not just that you're recording a story, that's important, but it's that this space is special. And so we have to allow space around it. Right. It's kind of interesting. So Ephraim, a, uh, a village of values, all these values. Let's see, is there anything else I missed? I think we'll just kind of begin to segue into the next <laughs> section. Anyway, um, the community values expressed by the foundation in this way. And I think we could, we could do a whole program just on this, oh, yeah. this uh, interesting brochure. Really quick though, yeah. anybody, does anybody oh, uh, over you. Zoom have any questions about that kind of segment? Comments? Or comments, concerns, anything? Once again, if you, I mean, if you have any questions in the middle of Kathleen speaking, uh, put them in the chat and I'll uh, try to, you know, get them asked for you too. But it doesn't really seem like anybody does. Well, let's move to um, this idea of, I guess, kindness through an example of, um, of, uh, Fran and Marion Fairday. And we're going to pull Marilyn Whiteley in in a moment. I'm going to set the scene, though, just a little bit. So Marilyn's grandparents had an orchard. I guess, um, Paul, you said you grew up with that, the Fairdigs living kind of across the road from you. Mm -hmm. What did you, what can you tell us about? Did you know? I Marilyn's grandparents, or were they gone by the time? No, he isn't. Um, not real well, but okay. Um, <clears throat> remember the orchard and the low trees. Now everything has grown up. Grown. My sister and I would used to stand in our kitchen window. We could see the school bus coming across mm. Town Line Road. Oh, and. <clears throat> Not dating ourselves too much. <laughs> but there are trees that are, are 60 feet tall. That, you know, yeah. Are now in the way. Now 60 feet tall. That is, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's, I'll pass around an article. I'm sorry, those of you out in Cyberland can't see it, but there's an article about a, a farm stand that they had. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, do you remember the farm stand at all? The, your grandparents had. Oops, she's muted. We've got to unmute. I certainly do, since I was <clears throat> the first one to have it. Oh. It was set up for me one summer. To keep you busy. And, and so <clears throat> during some of the time, I stood out there and or maybe sat on a stool, though that's not visible in the pictures, and waited for customers to drive by and sold them fruits and vegetables from, from the orchard and from my grandfather's large vegetable garden. And when I wasn't there, we left a, a bowl or box or basket for something to peep up for people to leave money in. Mm -hmm. One of my cousins staffed it several years later, but my grandmother kept it going um, <clears throat> in later years for many years. And she did some Swedish style folk painting. So she also offered things there that she had painted. Ashtrays, though my grandparents certainly did not smoke. <laughs> <clears throat> I, have, I have a picture of the stand <clears throat> that has a jug that <clears throat> on which she painted. And we still have that jug in our apartment. It did not sell. It did not sell. That's interesting. So your parents, we could spend uh, the whole, your family story is just fascinating to me. It's told in Marilyn's family booklet. 
lots that we could share about the grandparents. We're, I want to get to your parents because imagine it, everybody. The year is 1933, and you are Marion and Francis Ferdig. You've just been married. You're madly in love, I suppose. You have the world by the tail in, in a sense, even though something is happening around you. What world event? Depression. The Great Depression. But you think you're going to be okay because Francis, the husband, the newlywed husband, has secured a job. And then Marilyn, pick up the story. What happened? He thought he he thought he had a teaching job, if I recall. We'll have to unmute you again. Yes. <clears throat> they, <clears throat> they, I don't know when he learned that he didn't, but he thought he had a teaching job. And it turned out that <clears throat> someone in the county in Southern Illinois was more or less qualified to teach. And if that man didn't have a job, he would have to be put on welfare. But my father wasn't a resident of that county, so they had no responsibility to him. He wouldn't have to be welfare. <clears throat> so they gave the job to the other man instead. And so there were my parents, newly married, um, having come to Ephraim from southwestern Missouri and without a job for the following year. And so they ended up in a chicken coop? I don't have that quite right. The chicken well, <clears throat> the house, the two-story house that is still there, the Hauser family house now, um, was built for chickens, though it was two stories. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather and all his sons had made it <clears throat> habitable but at the time my parents were there in the summer of 1933, nobody had lived in it during the winter. It had just been a summer, a summer place while they worked on the orchard. So it was quite a pioneering adventure, I'm sure, for them to be there in that house for, for, <laughs> for a Door County winter for the first time. Yes. But that's what they did. And so there was a neighbor, and I think her name is listed on the back of the sheet, an unexpected <clears throat> beginning. There was a, a neighbor mentioned in your family history, and also, I forgot to mention earlier, in the reminiscences, but remini you know what I mean, by yeah. him, that Marilyn wrote an essay for. And I'm thinking of, um, let me see if I can find her name, uh, Matilda and August Erickson. Yes, they were not neighbors, but I can tell you exactly where they lived. If you go up Town Line Road and cross 42 and keep going on that road, they lived clear at the end of the road on the right-hand side in a house that had a marvelous view down over Little Sister Bay and on toward, on toward Sister Bay. And Eric Erickson, <clears throat> was the care caretaker for the home of Dr. Frederick Stock, the orchestra oh. conductor, mm -hmm. and also for the Hockmeister House, Interesting. where Martha yeah. Cherry grew up. So he was there as their caretaker. And so, they became very good, helpful friends for my parents. So, much, so August Erickson was the caretaker for a number of people, Frederick Stock and Martha Cherry's parents, and um, that's what you're saying. And there's something about WASH that I thought was kind of interesting. First of all, that there were gas-powered washing machines, and I'd heard that from somebody else up north. Um, and she went, your mom went to do WASH there? Right. There were, certainly weren't washing facilities in my grandparents' house in Ephraim, <laughs> so right. that's where my and that's where my parents took the laundry to be done. Yeah. And one of and as oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, as you were probably about to say, my mother reported that on cold days, when they threw out the wash water, 
it froze before it hit the ground. <laughs> right. And um, sometimes they would help pay for washing gas. And yes. noted, I did make a copy for people. It's hard to read. I, you know, I'm sorry about that. But there's some, <clears throat> your mother kept careful, meticulous, really, records of what money to spend. Mm -hmm. And one was 30 cents for washing gas. But there are some other things on here. I don't know if anybody can decipher. Can you, yeah, well, I don't know a, what A and P might have been. Do you have any idea, Marilyn? What A and P? I I saw. I see Andersons is listed twice on there. Yes, yeah, and Bundas or was it Bunda? Bunda. Okay, so tell Bunda. tell us about what Bundas was for those of us who don't know or might not remember. <clears throat> oh, the other people here will know Bunders, Bunda's dry goods store. Important source for <clears throat> things like clothing. So was that in Sister, Sister Bay? Bay? In Sister Bay. In Sister Bay. In, we're on deck. Oh, we're on deck. Is, oh, we're on deck. I thought it was some, I thought it was up by the grocery store. Yeah. Oh, so it was a dry goods store. When did that close? You, or, I know that after our <clears throat> after our two sons were born, I bought some clothing there for them. <laughs> cotton goods, cotton clothing <laughs> tended to be much less expensive in the U.S. than in Canada, oh, so right. I would shop at Bundas when we came during the summer. Oh gosh. Gosh, wow. Okay, well, on the same page, we, we have a story um, that kind of involves, well, it involves both your parents, but in particular, your dad. <laughs> and to lead us into, I'm talking about what's labeled the choir of fishermen. I don't know if I, did I share that one with you or did I yeah, get it? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, a choir of fishermen. Um, Marilyn, could you tell us why your dad, What a little bit about his musical talent, because that was something that um, kind of influenced their life a little bit. They were good singers <clears throat> and, excuse me, if I can add someone, something here, sure. a few of you may remember that at the Country Walk stores in Sister Bay, there was for a while one that sold Native American goods Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, the Choya, Choya tree. And once I was in there, I don't think I ever bought anything there, but I enjoyed looking at things. And once I was talking to the elderly woman, probably younger than I am now, who was working there and found out that she had grown up in the Gillswalk area and had gone to the Newport church. And so I told her about my father's connection and she had been a girl at the time and she remembered and she said, Oh, could he make those could he get though could he make those fellows sing? Yeah. He enjoyed doing the choir and the men enjoyed singing. But as I wrote here, they would be so tired from their day out on the water that they would refuse to sit during practice because if they sat in a warm room, they would go to sleep. Okay. This bothered my father because he knew he couldn't sit, but it was a little wearing on him to stand. He'd had yeah. polio as a boy, okay. but they insisted on standing and couldn't pay him anything. But every after every rehearsal, when he got back to his car, there on the seat of his Model A, carefully wrapped in newspaper, was the best whitefish catch of one of the men that day. And I was there when we were visiting, and I don't know whether it was someone in the Teske family or someone else from Gills Rock, when they were laughing about how he always thought his Model A got such good gas mileage, and he had not realized ever until then that it's because they had taken turns siphoning gas into his gas tank at each rehearsal. Isn't that great? And I think what's so terrific 
about the story, that particular part of your parents' story, is that it absolutely refl reflects landscape. It it is a Door County story. I mean, that's it, and it, so it's that it it puts you right in this spot, what it was like back then. But it also um, really illustrates uh, some of the other values that I think Ephraim and, and the county, but we're talking about Ephraim, hold up. The fact, you know, help, hold high. So the fact that, um, I'm going to lose my train of thought here. The, the fact that the fishermen were wanted to uh, stay standing was because they were out on the water. That's all about work ethic mm -hmm. and, and the value of work and the importance of work. And they were working together as fishermen too. So I just I just love this story. I think it's just terrific. Um, may I may I <clears throat> may I break in and tell you another story? It's not directly related, though it's about the fishermen, but I think it deserves to be in the record. And I don't know that it's recorded anywhere. <clears throat> um, a couple of the fishermen were caught. They they fished on the ice in the winter. And a couple of them were once caught on ice that broke away. Mm -hmm. And so they spent considerable time on an ice floe before they were rescued. And when they were, after they were rescued, they were asked, these sturdy gills rock fishermen were asked whether they would do anything different in the future. And one of them said, well, yes, after this, he'd always carry salt because raw fish didn't taste very good without salt. <laughs> That's really good. That's really good. Oh, yeah. 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 So kind of wrapping up this section in, in a sense, um, I have a couple questions for you, Marilyn, or a question for you, Marilyn, and then a question for the group. What did the kindnesses that that community, you know, the fishermen showed your dad? Um, let me my question. What did that mean to your parents? The kindness of the fishermen and of the neighbor, Matilda, what did that mean? Well, it certainly helped them, got them through what was a difficult time, but could have been an extremely difficult time mm -hmm. that gave them not only help, but faith in people, confidence in, in people. people's goodness. Oh, that's beautifully mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now for anybody who wants to answer, um, yeah. hold here with me. Okay, there's a certain reciprocity exchange in community life but what role, if any, does reciprocity play when it comes to kindness? In other words, kindness is kind, do, true kindness, is it something you, ex, do you give it freely with expecting nothing back perhaps? Or do you expect something? I mean, what's the role of reciprocity? What do you think? Yeah, Linda. As somebody who grew up in Ephraim, mm -hmm. and some of you spent lots of your childhood in Ephraim, you two also, I don't think any of us thought about it in that way. Mm -hmm. I think because it was out in the hinterlands, I mean, we were a big village, you know, big village. We weren't Chicago, thankfully. And I think we all assume even took it for granted that we would get help if we needed it and we would give help where we saw it was needed. Mm -hmm. I yeah. can't tell you the number of times that the various men of the village got up in the middle of the night and went out because they were volunteer firemen. Right. They didn't want their own house to burn down, so they went and helped somebody else's prevent from being burned down. But little things like Aunt Sadie is very sick and she is wobbling around and we shouldn't let her cook. Okay, 
everybody in town started bringing dinners for her, even if they weren't her relatives. It didn't matter who they were. And that went on both through the Lutheran Church and the Moravian Church was everybody in the village. Right. They did things for one another between churches. I have a good friend who is still a member of that Lutheran Church. We went to grade school together. I think it's important to put a lot of emphasis on the values that people at that time had and the trust that they yes. had in each other. Yes. Yeah. And I think these <clears throat> stories kind of, is, and we're going to share more in a minute, sort of illustrate that that is really what makes Ephraim unique. Or other communities can have that too, that up uplifting that value of helping each other, trusting each other, and knowing that that you were going to be part of it, not just the recipient, but the recipient, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, when something wonderful happened to somebody, we were very willing, able, and anxious to say congratulations. Uh, what can we do yes. to help this go further? Everybody yeah. rejoiced in everybody's happiness, and everybody grieved for everybody's mm -hmm. sadness. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't think that happens in a city because you can't possibly know 550,000 people. Well, you have your little neighborhoods that, that do that, I'm sure. But even those anymore are people stay inside their own houses mm -hmm. because you can interact on the computer or the telephone mm -hmm. or something. And mm -hmm. so you don't have a lot of in-person physical contact anymore with people. That's a good point. And the kids yeah. don't play outside anymore because no. of that reason. Well, so and, and fear of what might happen to you if you do go outside. Oh. So it all kind of feeds into each other. Well, I've been impressed with how the churches help each other and mm -hmm. get together and for a cause. And it may not be any one particular denomination. They just you know, say, this is needed, so let's all do it. Well, it seems as though the church communities up here aren't limited to what goes on inside the building. It's part of the community and it's interacting away from the established denomination or the mm -hmm. idea of religion. It, it's more of a lifestyle rather than something you do on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's evolving a little bit, but I, you know, mm -hmm. think, but I hope those values of helping each other continue. I think that's great. I wonder, Jeff, I'm going to put you on the spot because you're, you're the um, breaking our age yeah. 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 So I'm I wonder if you're listening to this thinking, well, I don't know, I look, maybe you're thinking, I've got a community of friends that are right there helping me all the time. That, that No, I definitely do. You know, uh, you know, I'm not from Door County, but uh, I moved up here, uh, I think in 2019, uh, and I've been coming up here my whole life, but I didn't like have an established group of friends here, but the kind of, when I moved here and I, I found my group of people it, I was, it, it was made sure that I was taken care of. Like, yeah. I, I think my first, uh, the holidays here, um, everybody offered, they're like, oh, come over, yeah. you know? Uh, so it's good to hear that that's yeah. still ha is still happening. Yes. Maybe we don't, you know, ring the church bell, come and gather. You might be texting somebody, mm -hmm. like, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, I think the sense of community is everywhere regardless of where do you live Jeff? Where do you uh, live? I so I'm in Egg Harbor right now uh I lived in Ephraim for about six months uh I mean when was that 2021 yeah towards the end of 2021 yeah well let's you've shared a kind of alluded to stories or in a broad general way we're going to kind of move more into if anybody else has a, st a story to share. Um, and I'm looking at this piece of paper because Rob Davis sent me a story to share. Let's see, and he said, I can't, this is again, Rob Davis, I can't find the document where my father, and that would be um, not Warren, but uh, Bob, Davis. Bob, Davis Bob Davis, tells this story in more detail, but this is what I remember. 
And by the way, he said he also remembered it's either Karen Eckberg or Linda Carey that babysat my sister and me that summer. Oh, it was Linda. Okay, it was Linda. Karen was my babysitter. Karen was your babysitter. Okay. Well, this is what he wrote or what he remembered. The Castles, that's the name of a couple, the Castles owned a log cabin immediately west of the Moravian Church Cemetery on Willow Street and enjoyed it every summer for many years. Does anybody here remember the castles? Okay, sometime, sometime in the late 40s or early 50s when they were advanced in years, they were faced with selling the cabin as their finances wouldn't allow them to keep both a summer and a winter home. This is when my grandfather, Warren T. Davis, a founder of the Ephraim Historical Foundation, purchased the cabin from the castles and gave them a life estate, meaning they could live in the cottage until they died. They didn't live much longer as my parents used the cabin in 1954, 1955, when I was about two. I think Warren sold the cabin shortly thereafter. Wow. So just, did you know that story, Linda? Mm -hmm. But it certainly sounds like something Bob would do. So a kind And the one thing about Bob that was, really amazing he gave money to everybody who came along and needed it all the businesses on ever hmm. but his it always said so and so much money donated anonymously anonymous mm -hmm. he never said his name interesting just did. yeah yes and there i mean i I sense. there's still people out there who a few of them who do that who don't you know who do, or quiet, and sometimes it doesn't have to be a lot. It's just helping somebody. Well, know? that goes back to the other story when right. people would bring a dinner. Yeah. If you're so sick that you can't get out of bed, but you're going to die if you starve to death, somebody will bring your dinner. Yeah. And that still happens. So what are some other stories? There might be somebody online who has a story they'd like to share too of a, some kind of a kindness in Ephraim or connected somehow to Ephraim. If you have a, a story, uh, let me know in the chat. I'll try to unmute you. One springs to my mind when my brother Steve, who was the first of the three siblings in our family to move up here and live full time, uh, Larry and I still come um, seasonally, let's say. But Steve moved up here full time, and his first job was an apprentice carpenter with Randy Nelson oh, no. construction. And one of the jobs was to um, put a roof on or do some renovation on one of the little um, the islands out behind uh, Horseshoe. Oh, one of the yes, one of the strawberry islands. And so he and Billy and maybe Butch Siler, because that was like the crew that worked together, would go out by boat from Ephraim and they would motor over there. And on this one particular day, it, um, they felt like if we just stay a little bit longer, we can get the job done and then we don't have to come back tomorrow. So unbeknownst to him, there were people in the village who were watching this group every day when they would go out and what time they would get back. Mm -hmm. And on this one day when they didn't get back at the expected time, they sent other boats out from me yeah. from to make sure that nothing had happened to them and make sure everybody got home safely. And he said he had no idea that they were watching out for each other like that in that way. And that was a real lesson to him in his late teens, early 20s, that he, now he was living in a place where people cared about what happened to you. Mm, gosh, that's mm, great. That's nice. mm, beautiful. Well, don't you love it when something what goes around comes around, they keep saying. Uh, when George and I were married in 1960, we invited lots of people who lived here and lots of people who didn't live here all the time, including Spenny and Libby Gould. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Spenny thought that one of the most important things in my family's home life was coffee. So he insisted that they would give me a new electric coffee pot, which they did. And a couple of years later, we were living in, let me think, Texas, I think, or it might have been Florida, but I think it was Texas. And he happened to come there on business. And 
I don't know when my mother let me know or something or another, I found out that he was there. So I called him up and said, can you come over? Oh, sure. He said, I have such and such amount of time between meetings. So he came over for what he said would be a half an hour. And I had hurriedly made a pot of coffee. So I was giving some coffee out of the pot and gave us. And he got the biggest charge out of that. And then, of course, he took us to the theater or something. You know, he was always doing something for somebody at some time. He was the most generous person I ever knew. Not just with money, but with himself. You have a lovely family member. Remember when they moved the books from the basement library to the new one? Yes. And they had all the kids. Yeah. Um, and make sure everybody stays in line so that the books would stay in order and you'd get your books and you carry them into the new one and go back for another load of books. And then you go old showed up and said that he was going to treat every kid to anything they wanted at Wilson's, not just an ice cream cone, but if you wanted like one of those giant <laughs> bottles of ice cream, that was fine with him. It was just like oh, unbelievable. Goodness. Yeah. <laughs> He always liked to be like convertible and he stuck his knitting in his convertible. He drove by it in gloves and I remember my brother talking to me. It must have had some kind of a convertible or something. And then they'd roll apples into the street. And if he hit an apple with the car, you know, they would try to avoid it. Then he, they would get a five dollar bill. So oh, of course, you know, it was crazy. You know, it's crazy. You know, it's crazy. You know, it's crazy. Well, you know, I have a story just of today, kind of a Ethan connection. Um, I hire this kid as a handyman, Keith Honnold. His sister, I believe, owns um, the old post office. His sister, Cammy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, Keith, uh, they said, I, I, I paid him for various jobs. But he has come through for me so many times. And the latest was when I broke my hip, my bed is high. And <clears throat> my daughter had mentioned to him that she was kind of concerned about me getting in bed. The next thing I know, he had stopped by in this block of wood covered with carpeting. That I can put by by the bed, very secure, and it it, it enables me to get out of you know, bed easily. Plus, I was able to carry it back to Illinois and do the same thing with the bed back there. Mm -hmm. And he refused to take it in for it, which I know was you know yeah. again in the city that wouldn't necessarily happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. In the city, most people don't know what a hammer is. Well, then, yeah. <laughs> I can say that having lived in five cities. <laughs> Any other stories or thoughts? Well, we're just about, hey, just about out of time. I have a couple last things. And of course, you're welcome to stay and linger and talk more. Um, and uh, number one, thank you, Marilyn, for being with us today. It was really fun to have somebody fill in a few of the a few of the gaps of, of, of our knowledge of, of your parents. We're going to, um, I'm hoping this coming year to revisit with Marilyn and talk about picking season in April and the uh, folks who were some of the laborers. So I'm gonna pass this around. This will be uh, a little bit drawn from some of Marilyn's memories that were in the book that she, the family book that she wrote. Well, that's one. Um, thanks to everybody else for being here. And I think what I'm going to do is leave you with a little, I hate to say assignment, because you don't have to really do it. <laughs> I've got a poem to share with all of you. It's not by somebody written in Ephraim, but it's one that has appeared uh, many, many times in children's anthologies of poetry. And this one happens to have been written by a man named Robert Hayden in 1962. He was born in Detroit and ended up becoming a poet and teaching at universities and so on. And it is a story or it's a memory really that takes place in winter. In fact, the title of the poem is Those Winter Sundays. So I'm gonna pass this out now. And I thought we'd just maybe take a minute I'll just read it together because those of you online can't see it, of course. 
those winter Sundays, and I wonder if maybe Jeff and I will take turns reading the stanzas, Jeff. If you could start out with the first one, I'll read the middle. And then what, why I'm passing this one out was, I think it um, might make us think about people who did kindnesses in our life that we really didn't know they were such an act of kindness at the time. So, <laughs> ready? Yeah. Okay. Sundays too, my father got up early and put on his clothes in the blue back cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday, weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he called, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well, what did I know? What did I know? of love's austere and lonely offices. Oh, I just think that's a beautiful poem. So with that, let's uh, give honor to those who've been kind and do kindness ourselves. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And feel free, there's more cookies and coffee and all kinds of stuff.